So in this series of videos, we're going to talk about an approach to using diuretics for treating patients with extracellular fluid overload. And this is typically uh, confined to patients with heart failure, acute decompensated heart failure, or even chronic kidney disease who have fluid overload as a consequence of their CKD. So the first step is to make sure your patient is limiting sodium intake. Remember that sodium is confined to the extracellular fluid volume. Remember, we've done this in other videos. Water moves to intracellular fluid volume as well as the extracellular fluid volume, but sodium is confined to the extracellular fluid volume. So we're assuming that the patient we're treating here has signs and symptoms of extracellular fluid overload. So pitting edema in the lower extremities, shortness of breath with pulmonary edema by exam or chest x-ray, and an elevated jugular venous pressure. Ultimately, our goal is to get them into negative sodium balance. So we want more sodium to leave the body than enter the body. And so first we have to make sure that the sodium entering the body is at least reduced because this will be a crucial factor to our success. So how much should we restrict? Well, for the patient with severe edema or someone who's going to be at risk of getting worse, developing fluid overload and shortness of breath and requiring hospitalization, let's aim for two grams per day or even less. Also, let's think about any drugs that may be present that actually enhance sodium retention. So NSAIDs, dihydropyridine, calcium channel blockers, minoxidil, and thiazolidinediones. This is a good opportunity to look at the patient's medication list and look for anything that's going to promote sodium retention. So get the patient off the NSAID first. So we've restricted sodium intake and we've stopped any inappropriate medications. Our next goal is to find the right loop diuretic dose that's going to do the job. First, we have to take a detour into the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of loop diuretics. So why did we even choose a loop diuretic? Well, we choose this in volume overloaded patients because at the ascending loop of Henle, there's that sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. That transporter is responsible for a reabsorption of 25% of the filtered load of sodium. So with one single drug that blocks reabsorption at that transporter, we can block reabsorption of 25% of the filtered load of sodium. So we get the most bang for the buck for one drug by using a loop diuretic. So next it's important to know how loop diuretics work in terms of how did they get where they need to be. And so Loop diuretics actually have a good amount of protein binding, and so they're not filtered at the glomerulus. They're actually actively secreted into the tubular lumen. And so here are the three things you need. You need renal blood flow, you need active tubular secretion, and then you need good tubular flow. So the drug has to be delivered to the kidney, and so you need good renal blood flow to do that. So on the basolateral side, there's a transporter and these are the organic acid transporters that are uh, responsible for processing other drugs or organic acids, right? And so in the proximal tubule, the loop diuretic is actually taken up and actively secreted into the lumen. Now, once the drug is in the lumen, there has to be adequate tubular flow so this uh, filtrate can make its way to the site of action, which would be the ascending loop of Henle. Now this graph will help us understand further how loop diuretics work. So look on the y-axis here, we have uh, sodium chloride excretion. This is lost in the urine, right? And then on the x-axis, we have the plasma concentration of diuretic. One key thing is that diuretics, loop diuretics, have a threshold effect, okay? And that's what this line represents. So below the threshold, we don't really have much in the way of sodium chloride excretion. But as soon as you hit the threshold, you have a very steep increase in sodium chloride excretion, okay? And I think a lot of us who have treated patients understand this. There's sort of a dose finding phase where you do not get an increase in urine output and sodium excretion, then all of a sudden you hit it and magic, boom, urine output increases, okay? There's also the ceiling effect where once you increase the dose, you get less bang for the buck. You get less sodium excretion compared to the increase in the diuretic dose. And essentially what we're describing here is that this is a transporter system. Once you saturate all the transporters with the loop diuretic, increasing the dose doesn't get you any more uh, blockage of reabsorption. So essentially once you've saturated your transporters, you do not get a dose-dependent effect. So this is key. Threshold effect. Below the threshold, you're not going to increase sodium excretion. Once you hit the threshold, this is where you want to work. You want to work in this area. And really don't waste time trying to escalate doses. 
above this area where you hit the ceiling. Once you're in the, above the threshold, that's all that really matters. So what we just described was in a normal person. And so look at the corresponding graph in a patient with decompensated heart failure or chronic kidney disease. There's a few things worth noting. Look, to hit threshold in the patient with heart failure or CKD, we have to give a higher dose of diuretic, okay? And then even once we hit threshold, our ceiling is lower. So we're going to get less sodium chloride excretion in a patient with kidney disease or decompensated heart failure compared to the normal patient. And why would this be? Well, there's many factors, and we're going to cover all these in this entire series, but a couple things to consider, like even a patient with decompensated heart failure, renal blood flow may be impaired. So maybe we're having a hard time delivering drug to the site of action, let's say in a patient with cardiorenal syndrome. Okay. Also, a patient with chronic kidney disease, these oat transporters, they transport other things besides just loop diuretics. And so you actually have to outcompete all the other things with the loop diuretic. And so a higher loop diuretic dose is necessary to outcompete all the other things to make its way into the tubular lumen. So there are all these other factors that are going to limit the effectiveness of loop diuretic in a patient who's sick who may actually need it compared to the normal person. Okay, the next concept to consider is that, remember, every drug has a half-life, and so this is true for loop diuretics, and so you're only going to get sodium excretion when the drug is at peak effect and blocking sodium reabsorption. But then as the drug concentration wanes, you're no longer going to have the natriuretic effect. And so this is worth considering um, in terms of loop diuretics, both IV and oral. So look, here we have the plasma diuretic concentration on the y-axis, and we have time on the x-axis. So right after an IV dose, look, there's a big peak. And let's just say for a normal patient, this green line here, as long as you're above the threshold, there's going to be net sodium excretion during this time. Okay. And now for an oral dose, look, as long as we're above the green line, that's when sodium excretion is going to occur. But you see that we get to threshold more slowly with the oral dose compared to the IV dose. And that makes sense because we have to allow time for uh, absorption from the gastrointestinal tract. Now, notice the red line. This is the patient with decompensated heart failure or chronic kidney disease. Look, because they have a higher threshold, we need a higher plasma diuretic dose until we get sodium excretion. And so for the IV dose, we're spending less time having sodium excretion. But look, we could still do it with an IV dose. But look what happened to the oral dose. We're spending much, much less time actually having effective sodium excretion or naturesis. And so this is something to consider for the patient with heart failure or chronic kidney disease. It makes it harder, and we have to assume that a higher dose is needed than we would otherwise give. So based on all that, as we're dosing loop diuretics, the first question is, okay, we gotta find the working dose. We gotta find the dose of diuretic, whether it's oral or IV, that's gonna hit threshold, right? As long as you're below threshold, it's gonna be ineffective. You just wanna get above the threshold. So. You know, for an outpatient, um, I don't have a great way to do this other than to ask patients, you know what, a few hours after we give you that dose, have you noticed that you pee more? And so I feel like patients, they are pretty good at knowing about um, how frequently they run to the bathroom after taking their loop diuretic. And so I know it's not scientific, but it's hard to do home monitoring of urine output. But if you have a patient who's willing to do that, that would be perfect, right? But in the hospital setting, you know, patients are sort of, uh, being monitored more closely, and it's easier to measure daily urine volume. So the whole point of this step is that it's a dose-finding mission. You need to find the dose that's going to hit threshold. And remember, for a patient with decompensated heart failure or chronic kidney disease, you're going to have to use higher doses and assume that you're going to need a higher dose and err on the higher side rather than the lower side, as that could save you time, perhaps. While we're talking about finding the right dose, we should compare the different loop diuretics. First, furosemide is the most commonly used uh, loop diuretic. Uh, most practitioners have a lot of comfortability with using furosemide, but it does have some limitations. For one, the oral bioavailability of the drug is about 40 to 50% on average, but it has a really, really wide range. Look, anywhere from 10 to 90% bioavailability. That seems pretty wide to me. Also, food delays the GI absorption. And so one important factor is that absorption is limiting the pharmacokinetics of the drug. 
And so in other words, the excretion half-life is shorter than the absorption half-life. And this just introduces another layer of complexity, another error, essentially. And so let's say that everything is perfectly normal. Let's say absorption is great for furosemide, and we gave the drug, and then it's absorbed, we hit naturesis, and then we excrete the drug. And so as long as there was enough drug above the green line, we had sodium excretion. But let's say that absorption is delayed for some reason. Let's say there is food in the way or there's gut edema. You see it takes longer to get to threshold and we spend less time in threshold. Okay, And so we actually will get less naturesis even though the same drug was given. And so when absorption is slowed down, uh, we're probably less likely to hit threshold and it's going to take us longer to find the correct dose that will result in naturesis. So this is where some of the other drugs, I think, show their promise and bumetanide and torsamide are the other oral and IV loop diuretics. And in terms of oral dosing here, both have greater than 90% bioavailability and the pharmacokinetics is not limited by absorption, unlike furosemide, which is heavily limited by absorption. Particularly, torsamide deserves special attention. It seems to have the longest half-life in patients with heart failure. Look, about 6 hours compared to 1.3 hours for bumetanide compared to 2.7 hours in furosemide. And so, in general, torsamide has been kind of my go-to diuretic, mainly because of the enhanced bioavailability and the longer half-life. Whereas with furosemide, I have concerns about the wide range of oral bioavailability, the concerns about how food can interfere with absorption, and also about gut edema, how that slows absorption as well. Remember, I think the key to dosing diuretics is that you have to find the dose that's going to hit threshold. I feel like I'm more likely to hit that threshold earlier by using something like torsamide or bumetanide rather than furosemide. I feel like using furosemide alone takes a little bit longer and more trial and error. And so you may be able to get away with spending more time on a dose finding mission, but in general, patients who are fluid overloaded are at risk of developing severe symptoms like respiratory failure or severe functional limitations. And in those settings, I don't think it's prudent to spend too much time trying to find the effective dose. I think it's uh, better to spend as little time as possible to find the effective dose as soon as possible and to start achieving net negative fluid balance. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of studies looking at the comparative effectiveness of the loop diuretics, but there was a systematic review that suggests that the use of torsamide compared to furosemide reduced hospital admissions among patients with heart failures. 